right oh uh a welcome return uh phil carney great to have you back uh, how are you good thank you very nice to to be back very nice to to be catching up again yeah brilliant brilliant um just before we started recording, I was lamenting the fact that we weren't able to, um, I wasn't able to get together with you guys at the um, Movement Skill Acquisition Ireland conference, because uh, obviously uh, a, a whole range of factors meant that you guys had to sort of pull out relatively late. But um, yeah, that would have been that would have been fun, and I'm looking forward to whenever you do manage to uh, find a venue and and pull it off in the future at some stage. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, it may have to go as a as an online piece just to pull the, the speakers never together in the first instance. But um, definitely talking and exploring what that that next in person connection might be, whether it's even smaller scale local pieces. Mm. But I think that that nothing beats just sitting in a room and thrashing stuff out and and just connecting with people on that. I think it's it's uh, even even disagreements seem easier in a room than they do on, on maybe a social media space. It seems more likely to work them out. 100%. And that's something we're going to circle back to in a minute. Um, yeah. I mean, it was going to work out really nicely, actually. I'd managed to make it into a bit of a, a bit of a kind of two or three day breakaway with, with my wife, mainly due to the fact that she's just opening a new business in the kind of wellness space. And there's a, uh, an Irish brand um, wellness brand that she's just taking on who are based in Cork. So it was going to work out really well, but um, as it happens, it, it's, it's not the end of the world. We'll, we, I'm sure we can uh, make a visit to Cork separately to having to go in a conference, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was lovely. Anyway, just quickly, if you wouldn't mind, um, remind the listeners who may not have heard the first the first time you were on it's quite some time ago i was looking through the back catalog the other day to see when it was um just give us a quick um lowdown as to you know what you're up to and and the, the work that you do yeah sure so um phil carney i am working here at the university of limerick where i am the course director for our master's program in applied sports coaching um so i have a really nice job in that i get to spend my time with a number of coaches who are typically 10 to 15 years experience, really passionate about what they do. And I get to try and facilitate their development to explore what's happening in their context. What do they need to do to get better at whatever they're doing? Whether that's again, from grassroots to, to high performance. So um, that is, is a really nice aspect of what I do. And so for the last few years, I've been spending an awful lot of time in, in relation to coaching and coaching is the, the core area I'm looking at. Um, but, as you mentioned with Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland, my research area, my training, my passion in terms of a, an area of science is skill acquisition. It's understanding how, how learning happens and how we can accelerate that and the benefits that can, can come out of that as well. Um, I have researched lots of different areas in terms of skill acquisition over the past few years. I'm, I'm, I need to really focus a bit more probably um, but I just find so many areas fascinating from, again, whether it's children's fundamental movement skill development, whether it's um, designing and delivering better individual practice sessions, whether it's long term talent development and the questions that come around there as well. Um, so I think and again, that's been quite useful for, for interacting with, with coaches, with the practitioners across a range of different aspects. Um, more recently, I'm the. Uh, skill acquisition lead on the Gaelic Games Sports Science Working Group, which has been trying to, to prepare some guidance for, um, for coaches and applied sports scientists in the future, in the near future, hopefully, we can get that over the line. Um, and also now that the, I'm on the editorial board for the Journal of Motor Learning and Development, which is kind of a, a nice piece from a, a scientist and, and enhancing the quality of science that exists. So really pleased to be involved with, with that group as well, because um, I think that there's some really nice guidance for everybody actually coming out of that journal. So really nice to be able to steer that as well. Busy, busy then. <laughs> plenty, plenty on. Uh, your, your point about specializing resonates. Um, I sometimes describe myself as a neo generalist, um, which apparently has been, has been the, uh, the thing that, that uh, people that employers are looking for these days, which is, you know, somebody with a fairly broad base. I like to think of myself as maybe T-shaped, 
you know so i'm not I'm not very narrow i've got a broad general understanding and then there's a bit of narrowness in specific areas um but anyway i'm not sure about that but i find it extremely difficult i'd be probably like you it's extremely difficult when you're in this space there's so many fascinating areas of uh to, to kind of explore and discover and to learn about that actually getting very niche in something as complex as as human development becomes extremely challenging doesn't it because the other reason being of course is it's all everything's interconnected so what, the minute you learn about one area you realize it's got connections with other areas and then you go down that rabbit hole and then you have to reverse out and come so it's extremely challenging to become specialized in this field i'd say it definitely is there's so <laughs> many reasons that you could be just distracted away and, and productively distracted away yeah because again i think the i i can defend my general uh, interest in so many different things by saying well you know you can always take some ideas from other domains and bring them across so it's really important to be to be going across what looks like chaos to the outside there really there's a there is a plan trust me there's a plan in there somewhere <laughs> So anyway, uh, the, one of the reasons we came back together, I mean, we don't necessarily have to dwell on this, but but I think it, what, how we described this before we started recording was maybe doing a bit of sense making together. You you got in touch because you you listened to my conversation with Jordan Cassidy, um, which is interesting because it sparked quite a bit of discussion and debate in the social media space, as sometimes it does. Um, and it was part of a, uh, I guess, a, an experiment, really, which was, you know, I'd, I'd sort of put this call out to have some conversations with people who, you know, maybe I haven't got entire agreement with. Um, and we're exploring, you know, kind of where are, where is the the challenges and this, that and the other. And you reached out because obviously you'd had some thoughts about that and, uh, you know, and and it stimulated a bit of a discussion. Um, and then I thought, well, it's much better to actually uh, vocalize this conversation. Plus, we hadn't seen each other for quite a while. So what, what better reason to, to reconnect, get on the, on the podcast and, uh, and have a chat. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind just sort of, I guess, articulating the point you were putting across to me, and then we can take the discussion wherever it goes. Yeah, so the, the bit that, that or Again, one of the bits, because I really actually like what Jordan does. I think his blog is really nice and how he tries to make sense of things. It's a lovely role model, model for individuals as to you know, how to engage with material. Um, but there was a discussion that you had about basically coaches having a, a learning theory or having a theory about learning. Um, and again, this is, this is me thinking as a scientist, because when I think of the word theory, I think about something that's quite well developed but you know the elements in it are carefully chosen they fit together particularly well um, and the comment the main comment I made in the uh, reply I made or the, the tweet I sent when I gave you a bit of commentary on it um, was that I absolutely believe that you know coaches beliefs influence their practice and maybe we could talk about some, some examples of that um, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that coaches often have a theory something that's well formulated I used a, a term, they have a bundle of beliefs mm. and these beliefs, you know, they, they, in some cases, there are coaches with really well developed, really well thought through beliefs about what they do and why they do it. And these are typically operating at a, at a very high level. Um, and sorry, when I say operating at a high level, as in they're delivering excellent coaching, regardless of who they're delivering that coaching to. So I think if, if they, there are individuals who have really thought through and carefully considered why they do what they do, that's really well developed. But I think you have other individuals who are at the opposite end of the spectrum and they almost, and often again, this is more novice coaches, but they're just repeating what they think coaching is because it's how they were coached and or what they've seen. And they haven't really tested or considered, you know, why they do what they do. Um, and then you've got, Kind of in the middle so i said bundle of beliefs because you know maybe some of the beliefs that they hold are not altogether consistent or coherent or well developed and so for me it's it's an interesting one in the when you are working to develop coaches um how important is it how do we start to unpack well what are your beliefs why do you coach the way you do what is shaping the way you coach um and this is where, again, I, we talked about this as a sense-making conversation. Um, just to explore between the two of us, actually, how do you go about unpacking someone's beliefs and then the tricky bit, challenging someone's beliefs or getting them to challenge and test their own beliefs um, in a way that, that leads to development? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I, I remember distinctly 
there was there was an exchange that so, uh, Chris Kilmurray got involved. He's obviously been on the show. Very very um, articulate and clearly very you know kind of intelligent coach. who was really you know kind of got into uh, the why of his practice you know on a big way. And he's a very quite powerful and forceful advocate for I, I guess what you might call theoretical pluralism. This idea that you're borrow you're continuously borrowing from different theoretical positions in your quest as a coach for solutions that are going to support your athlete, and his his view is, you know, limiting yourself to a particular bag of <laughs> theory or a particular you know kind of strand of theory uh, is is a is seems to be you know not not a smart move you know uh, when you're trying to be pragmatic with with an athlete there's a lot of merit to that um uh, but this in, and interestingly he said um because he was sort of a bit of an exchange between him and cal jones and cal jones is he is a uh, a force to be reckoned with on twitter his ability to capture a discussion in you know 240 characters is really quite impactful and he gets to the nub of it, you know, and his his view is, you know, you can't more or less a bit like what David Farouk says, you know, you can't simultaneously believe that the world is round and flat, albeit you still walk the same way through it. Anyway, um, so it's an interesting discussion and with lots of angles we can go down. But Chris, Chris was saying, you know, it's not about belief because he was challenged by Cal that it's about belief, you know, believing in, for example, particular forms of homeopathic remedy and these sorts of things, you know, and how they might, you know, you do this and this and this and you, you can convince yourself that these things work. And he said it's not about belief. And I remember it sort of stuck, stuck with me, that statement, because I was thinking to myself, is it actually? And then funnily enough, you're your message came through about this idea and I was thinking is it about belief because I think the point I tried to make to Jordan is the point that Rob Gray's made in the past which is uh, whether you're whether you think you're operating from a particular learning theory or a learning paradigm or not you are <laughs> because there is one out there that or there are fit there they are out there and they do exist and the majority of us are operating under one by virtue of the fact of the influences that we're influenced by within the world of education and elsewhere. So, you know, this is the, I guess the point he tries, tries to make is that there is a, there is a model there that whether you think it or not. And again, is that, is that belief? And I, and I think as people become more theoretic, theoretically literate, shall we say, you know, in the quest for answers, eventually you become more theoretically literate and you then have more of an understanding of the different theoretical positions, the differences between them, what the offshoots are. And I'll come back to defining some of this a bit later. But yeah, I, and I, so I was thinking to myself, uh, do we operate under beliefs? And I think in the early stages of my uh, coaching, I definitely was operating out of belief. It was I, I didn't have a theoretical basis definitely didn't i knew there was some incongruity between the practice that i was adopting and the basis of that practice and i knew it was it it, it didn't quite sit well with me but it took 15 years to work that out you know of, of kind of difficulty and pain and it was i think based on the idea that there were some beliefs around practice which i had received in both my education and wider learning about things both you know my formal education you know doing a sports degree and a pedagogy um you know module within that but also in the wider stuff i'd learn around um you know different forms of pedagogy and also the stuff i'd put in my formal kind of coach education and the me methods that they proposed which clearly come from a particular the theoretical standpoint and it's only really when i made a bit of a discovery through some exploration, searching for answers, that I discovered an alternative. That then I was thinking, oh, now this seems to have more promise for me. This feels more aligned to where I think I am and where I think I want to go to. So I guess, I guess, sorry, it's very long-winded and probably a lot to unpack. But for me, I think it's like I think I had a set of beliefs, and well, I said I had a set of beliefs handed to me that were incongruous. I had alternative beliefs, but I didn't have a theoretical basis for them. And so I found a theory that mapped to my beliefs. And that's why I want to adhere to, okay, I guess that's one of the reasons I adhere so passionately to it, because it's so ingrained and aligned to my beliefs. 
So I'm wondering how that juxtaposition works, really, between sort of belief and theory. Does everybody operate under belief? I don't know. So anyway, sorry, that's a really meandering response. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. Make, make, make what you will of, of that. <laughs> um, I, but, okay, so I'll try and make a couple of points and we'll see where we go with this. Um, one is just an observation. This is maybe a light observation, but um, I sometimes wonder about this, this idea of why would you want to limit yourself to one theoretical perspective? Mm -hmm. um, my and, and i'll use ecological dynamics as, as an example because i've met a lot of coaches recently who've discovered ecological dynamics and they're very enthusiastic about it mm. and i sometimes think that enthusiasm is misconstrued mm -hmm. because people go you know hang on a second but it's a genuine passion and enthusiasm mm. people feel that they found something that opens up new opportunities that allows them to be more effective in what they do mm. so it's a real enthusiasm for how this can help them. And again, typically, I don't meet people who are who feel limited by that theory. Actually, they feel the theory is, is allowing them to do more things. Mm. And they're you know, still exploring aspects of that. Now, again, that we might come back to that a little bit, but I think that's an important first point that you know, oftentimes people who are kind of exploring and applying these theories to begin with. They don't feel limited by it. No. Actually, they feel so many opportunities Indeed. from engaging with this. And it's really helpful. And it's, it's, it's allowing them to grow. Um, so that's that's one aspect. I think, I think a second one is around um, this idea of you know, why you do things and doing things because of consciously held beliefs or doing things because of unconscious influences that you might not be, be aware of. Yeah. Um, I think for me, you know, there's an example I think of when I think about, you know, how does belief influence coaching? And it, it relates to um, life skills or transferable skills, things around goal setting, leadership, you know, being a good follower, all these kinds of aspects. Um, I think an awful lot of people would say that sport has the potential to develop life skills. Would you be yeah. go along with that? Yeah. Okay. But there are two different strands to this. And Aaron O'Connell was a basketball coach I work with who's, who's absolutely fantastic around this. And he really emphasized sport does not automatically lead to the development of life skills that will help you in other areas of life. You have to help the athlete or help the player understand how they can transfer these life skills to other areas of their life. So the things you're learning about planning and motivating yourself within basketball well, you can also use that to plan and motivate yourself in your academic study or your whatever the, the case may be, but it doesn't automatically transfer. Mm. You've got to actually help the learner transfer it. So you can imagine two coaches, one coach who believes that what you learn in sport automatically transfers and another coach who believes it doesn't automatically transfer. You have to actually help them to make that jump, make that gap. Mm. Those are two different beliefs which I think will lead to coaches who behave and act in a different way. Yeah. So I think beliefs absolutely can change, you know, what we see a coach do on the ground. And I'm really interested in, in most importantly, changing what a coach does on the ground and understanding, okay, well, what's the, what's the route, what's the vehicle through which I change their practice on the ground. And actually, do I need to change their underpinning beliefs because that's the anchor that holds their behaviors. It holds their anchors. Mm. If I want to change a coach's behavior, do I need to understand what's the belief that anchors that behavior? And do I need to, if I want to change the behavior, do I have to catch or figure out what that underpinning belief is first and then change that? That's really interesting. As you're talking, I'm reflecting and thinking, I think, we're all so I think belief can sometimes be I think initially when I when I sort of saw the word I, I think for me it felt um what's the word it felt like it was being used in a kind of quite a negative way and it does have I think some sort of fairly negative con con connotations the sense being that if you're operating from belief you're not operating from evidence and I think that seems to be where 
sometimes the language has gone in sort of society, which is, you know, there's a group of people who are operating from faith, let's say, you know, um, and there are other people who are operating, say, from science. And, you know, and you can often see, you know, kind of the atheist versus uh, uh, religious yes. individual debate going on. You know, the recent there was a recent one, actually, by a guy called Alex O'Connor, who I follow, uh, who's a philosopher. I find him fascinating, the, the way his logic works, amazingly articulate. Um, and he had a debate with Ben Shapiro, you know, who's like a pretty famous, you know, kind of... Um, you know, religious sort of icon, you know, kind of the what you might call the alt right in America, and um, really interesting conversation actually. And they handled it in really good faith. And going back to your point about having discussions in face to face and having the it just shows how having an, a, a good faith discussion is really fascinating. What I always find a bit disappointing subsequently is how you get loads of commentators jumping on it and going, "Oh, such and such destroyed such and such." I really don't like that. But anyway, anyway. I've digressed massively, but coming back to this notion of and this notion of belief versus evidence and the burden of proof and all that sort of stuff. But actually, the more I think about it, like even if you're evidence based or even evident, let's say evidence informed or theoretically informed, you have a theoretical basis, and then there's sort of an there's empirical work that sort of supports the. The, the the sort of theoretical positioning and that uh, empirical work you then utilize and the sort of and some of the you know kind of, sort of you're utilizing then to build a kind of picture around what how how you intend to operate you're still operating from belief in some respects because none of the theories certainly in our field are strong enough yet to be almost like conclusive 100 percent so i have to accept and i'll you know be open that you know kind of my the theoretical underpinnings of my practice and then the work that i then do and the approaches that i then take are founded on a belief in uh the underlying ideals and and principles of this theoret of this theory but it is a belief because i couldn't hold my hand on my heart and say it's definitely this even though I might have said that in the past, or I might have might have been overzealous, perhaps in some of my language of the past. I don't know if I ever have, and I'd, it, you'd have to go back through five and five hundred hours of audio to work out whether I have said that. But you know, I, and I, I and I'm accused of saying you know one theory to rule them all and all those sorts of things. I don't think I've ever said that. I've said in the balance of probability, and certainly from my own perspectives, this is where I'm happy to live for a while. Um, and I want to expand it and I want to explore it. And in order to do that, I'm going to deliberately move myself away from the previous approach, which I didn't find a great deal of um, value in. So I guess this notion of belief is quite powerful, actually, because it's not it's not to say just because you're operating from belief means that you're somehow like, you know, get not oh, I'm not bothered about evidence. I'm just going to go with what I believe. No, it's a belief based on and you know some understanding of various theoretical standpoints and all those sorts of things and to a certain extent i always feel that a lot of my work is testing my beliefs testing my hypotheses testing the strength of those and to see where i can get to with some of this stuff um yeah but if i'm honest i have to understand it as belief yeah and I think, again, this is why it's, it's just so important, regardless of what it is that we're, we're discussing, that we just understand what we mean by these basic terms. Mm -hmm. So that's a, this is a great exploration of, you know, belief. What does that term mean? And then we can bring it down to just real practical aspects. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one of the things I will see a lot is coaches who give an enormous amount of feedback. They're almost con continuously commentating on what they see and what's happening in front of them giving as much information as possible. So I would say that that is coming from a belief that immediate feedback enhances learning yep. or immediate feedback enhances learning better than, than delayed feedback. Um, so that's, again, I, I kind of go with that as a, as a level of belief. And then you can go investigating well, what's the evidence for that. Um, yeah, I, I might come back to, you've also made me think about evidence-based practice or evidence-based medicine and what exactly does that mean but i'll come back to that if i stick with the feedback for a second um okay so there's a belief that immediate feedback is better for learning 
Now, that is a lovely example for me of where we're just not quite seeing the key element there. The key element is not about the timing of feedback. The key element is whether the learner can connect with the feedback or not. Mm. If a learner can connect with the feedback, can understand how this relates to them, then it's more likely to be effective than feedback that the learner cannot connect with. Mm. What does this mean? Mm. Timing, giving feedback immediately after something has happened is one way to try and get the connection, but it's not the timing that's important. It's the connection that's important. <laughs> and sometimes immediate feedback actually is worse at connecting with the learner because the learner might be in the middle of gameplay. And so they're trying to keep track of where that runner is going and that runner is going. And so they're, they're already occupied. They can't be listening to what's coming in from the sideline. Or the learner is just is annoyed, is frustrated, and therefore whatever you say isn't going to be listened to at this moment in time. So actually, we want, feed, we want learners to be able to connect with the feedback, and that's the key bit. That's the bit that's really important. Timing is just one method that we have of connecting the learner with the feedback. And sometimes, yes, that will work quite nicely, but it doesn't have to be. There are other ways in which we can connect the learner to the feedback. We can, you know, bring them through the scenario again. What was happening there? Can you talk me through? So I guess for me, this is where that's a belief. You know, I believe that immediate feedback is important. Well, I would say that that's something that has to be tested and challenged. So we can look at some of the evidence as to whether that, that is actually true. But also it really illustrates that actually we might be focused on the wrong thing. I, do, I would argue strongly that it's not the timing of feedback that's most important. Timing is just a shadow of the more important issue, which is, can the learner connect with the feedback? It's the connection that we want. And your point about that being based on, on beliefs, you made me then think, I wonder how, how deep that belief is based, or what the belief would be based on. Again, you know, is it, this is just what I've seen, this is what I've, because it's interesting, you know, I, a bit like you, you know, spend a lot of my time in front of coaches, um, you know, sharing ideas with them and talking. But one of the questions I pretty much ask every single time, you know, so this isn't necessarily data, but it's been, I've asked it a lot and I get a similar response each time to the, to the point where there's a theme emerging here. So actually, you know, there's something that we can consider, which is if I'm in a room with a hundred coaches and I ask the question, why do you do what you do the way that you do it? nearly always the answer is experiential in in nature now again this is self-reporting so you know it may be based on but it's generally based on this is what i experienced i thought it was good so i thought i'll do more of it or i'll do the same or this is what i experienced i thought it was bad so i didn't want to do that for anybody else so i do it i do it the opposite way generally speaking they're the two answers i get in the main the majority then there's all there's there's a few others as well of oh i've read this or i've i had this look i went on this course and it, they taught me that it's rarely interestingly though it's rarely the coach education that they refer to um uh so it's interesting uh, yeah so the the influences are largely experiential in think, in my experience yeah and i think i think there's a, a kind of a really important point to make there so again uh, I've been reading and thinking more about, you know, what does it mean to be a scientist? What is it the scientist does? And, and there's a quotation from um, Richard Feynman, which is that the, the most important person, or the, the most important thing is not to fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool because, you know, you're, you're working on an experiment. You've got a hypothesis. You want to prove that hypothesis. Actually, as a scientist, you really need to, to put things in place to make sure that you're not being misled by your experience. And our experience absolutely can mislead us time and again and again. Um, that's why you have things like, like uh, the, the most expensive animal in the world is a, a duck from the south of France. The reason it's the most expensive animal in the world is because its liver, I think, is used to create an enormous amount of homeopathic medicine, which wow. generates the entire annual sales for this company. Now, oftentimes people will take this medicine 
when they're feeling really, really bad with the cold. And then the next couple of days, they start to feel better. So the perception is, the experience is that I wasn't feeling good. I took the, med the homeopathic medicine. Now I feel better. Now, that is, of course, one possible explanation as to what's happening. But the other possible explanation is just regression to the mean. People get better after they have a cold. And the timing of it just happens to, to coincide in that instance. And so there are many, many ways in which our experiences can be can be deceived mm. and so we need to be very careful to be constantly testing and figuring out well actually what is this true does this hold up more generally um and i think gradually that's where, where theories can be really helpful mm. because again the, the theory that underpins you know homeopathy is that this is that water has memory mm. now the idea that water has memory is a really really discomforting thought when you think about the filtration and where your drinking water comes from and, and the memory that that water might hold, that's not a, not a direction you want to spend too much time on. But I think for me that this is why, you know, some theories are really important in terms of actually, you know, we, we haven't got a mechanism to support that. So I'm going to be quite comfortable leaving that aside and looking at for, for some other explanation. Having just brought homeopathy into this, I, and it's something you said at the start, you talked about, you know, uh, the earth is flat or the earth is round. And I've seen, I actually do think I saw one of one of Cal's comments, and I think it was it was germ theory versus crystal theory in terms of treating. I actually don't think that's helpful mm -hmm. because I think within kind of skill acquisition, the domains that we're looking at, you know, I, I, I don't see contemporary theories from any approach being equivalent to flat earth or crystals. Yeah. I think, no, hang on a second. We need to just catch our language here, catch our enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And and again, this is, um, Dan Cleaver has a, a really nice book called Subvert around what the, the modern scientists should, should be. And he has a, a big point about how we've built this model of science on conflict. We'll take this view and we'll compare it against this view and we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll fight these two off against each other. And... What that encourages is selectively choosing your best example and the worst feature of the opponent and putting those up against each other. And again, through the academic literature going back 40 years, you'll see examples of people doing this. Um, we don't do enough of is a consensus building approach. You know, I'd love to see some scientific literature which didn't have two letters to the editor arguing with each other and ignoring each other's points. I'd much rather see one letter to the editor which is a discussion and a, a iterative back and forth between the two sides to see well what have we got in common where are our key differences and what are the next steps that we can take to try and resolve or, or bring this apart um but we don't see too much of that because we, we we just have gone for this conflict model as opposed to this consensus building model yeah that's that's an interesting um yeah, an interesting insight. I, and I, my my understanding of the scientific process, and I'm you know I'm, I'm no scientist. I'll be the first to accept that. Albeit, I like to have conversations with genuine scientists such as yourself, and I like to discuss and explore you know kind of things from uh, a scientific and a theoretical position. Um, and yeah, you're right. I mean, well, but I always understood that the part of the scientific process was to uh, essentially postulate a theory and then to try and prove yourself wrong. Yes, that's, the, that's, that's certainly an ideal. That's absolutely <laughs> an ideal. Which is and... difficult to do, isn't it? Because then, you know, you see then people sort of essentially defending a theory. So like, for example, I've been quite a staunch defender, say, of growth mindset. Um, nice example. You know, yeah. So a uh, now, by all accounts, you know we have a replication crisis in psychology, and uh, Carol Dweck's research has not necessarily been replicated elsewhere. So I look at that and go, hmm, "That's worrying, isn't it?" Because what I felt was a very powerful and strong theoretical position, um, you know, now is is sort of being thrown into question, and then. I then think, well, like, 
the danger with all of this is that you know when a, a theoretical stance then gets essentially you know and as a pol I'm also a policymaker in my day job right so you then think okay well we can make policy based on this this the theory right we can we can establish a a policy and we can you know embed that into you know the practice that we would want to see amongst the practitioners in our in our in our world and then you think and then you see that coming along and basically it gets essentially or in get, uh, doubt gets cast over that theoretical standpoint and then you've got egg on your face as a policymaker so what you then do and what i think a lot of policymakers do is they sort of hedge their bets and either avoid the research and the, so, so then you get a lot of researchers criticizing organizations for not being evidence-based or they try and build some consensus and it sounds to me that the stuff you're doing with GAA is trying to do that you're trying to sort of br bring together different scientific traditions in order to then create a consensus position that the sport can align to at least for a period of time but the challenge I think for me with that is that I, the danger is, is that you sort of all, almost become, and I've used this phrase before, you know, you, you become theoretically rudderless or you do a bit of a um, a mix and match, you know, and I'll have a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other and you cobble it all together. And then you and then you create, you know, you're sort of a coherent narrative that you stick with for a period of time until such time that you either feel it's no longer valid or it's no longer got the, the strength that it once had. And then you sort of change gears. But that's how I've seen a lot of sports policy making happening over my lifetime. And I've been involved in that myself and done a lot of that myself and look back and think, Christ, what was I doing? But the danger well, is, Sarah, sorry, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, because a couple of things that I'd love to get into on that. But I think number one is we often spend so much time focusing on the differences mm. and amplifying the attention to the differences that we forget how much we have in common mm. and we forget how far we can go with that element, those elements that we agree with. Mm. And so I think that's definitely something that gets, gets lost an awful lot. And you can give the, the, the simplest of examples as conditioned games or small sided games, no theoretical approach owns that particular coaching aspect. The benefits that accrue through such games can be explained whether it's through ecological dynamics and the mechanisms around self-organization and affordances, or whether it's through more representation-based theories and the, very, the various representations that are required to, to support performance there. The, the, the two mechanisms are very different. They come from very different roots, mm -hmm. but they both advocate the use of, of contextualized games and, and the right level of contextualized games, not over, not under, demanding in terms of what you're posing to the individuals so i think number one there's been so much focus on on again trying to to best other theories that we lose track of just how much commonality exists in terms of some of the recommendations that are there um i think the growth mindset example is, is a lovely one because that as a lot of scientific studies did it came in 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 i think the late 1980s and a, with a slightly different name, then it absolutely exploded and everyone was talking about growth mindset. But it's not just the popularity of the idea that exploded, it was also the power of the idea. In yes. other words, the, the sales claims that were being made about just how transformative this idea was. And there's a, there's a Scott Kelso quote that I really like, there is seldom any absolute truth in science. There is you know, very few things that will work for everybody equally and across the board universally. It just doesn't happen. Um, growth mindset is something from, again, and it's not my particular area, um, but the latest research I've seen show, suggests that there is a small genuine effect. Now, small does not mean insignificant. You know, if you can make a small improvement in someone's schoolwork or whatever the case may be, that's of absolute genuine benefit to them, but it's been oversold and there's a little bit more work involved than a, a very simple instructional manipulation um, or putting a poster on a classroom. You know, there's much more than that required in order to change someone's belief from a fixed to a growth mindset, for instance. Um, and that, I think, comes back to, to, to that original definition of, of evidence-based 
practice or evidence-based medicine. Um, I think an awful lot of time people read or see the idea of evidence-based practice and they think, oh, that means you follow what the research says. But it's not. There are three ingredients in evidence-based practice. Now, evidence-based is probably not the best term. I think evidence-informed is a nicer term, yeah. but yeah. evidence-based is the original term. And how that was defined was having three components. Number one, what guidance can you get from the existing theory and research so that you're not rudderless, so that you're not you know, trying to do this um, based sure solely on your own experience as opposed to the distilled experience of all those who have come before you and trying to tackle this problem. So number one, there is that body of evidence out there. But that's not the only thing that needs to be considered. Second thing that needs to be considered is the learner's perspective or the individual, the patient's perspective in, in evidence-based medicine. Um, because it could be the case that the, the individual has met a coach who used that approach previously, didn't use that approach very well, because people can, people can coach from a, a representation theory-based approach very badly, and they can coach from a constraints-led approach very badly. I think I've done both at different stages in my development as a coach. So, you know, a learner might have an initial reaction to this, which is coming from their previous experiences, which needs to be taken into consideration. Somebody who's hesitant versus somebody who's enthusiastic, of course, you're going to approach those in a slightly different way. So, okay, we've got the first piece is evidence-based. What does the evidence, the research, the theory tell us? Second, what's the learner's perspective? And then the third is your professional judgment as a practitioner, because the context you're in might be subtly different to the context that you've met before. There might be some unique characteristics that you, you need to consider. And so it's not a case that you're, you're blindly applying the research, but you are critically thinking, okay, what are the limitations in this, this research that I might need to consider here? And any good research has a limitation section where they say, and again, I'll exaggerate here for simplicity, you know what, we did this research with adults. Same thing might not apply if you're working with children. Coach might go, okay, there's no research on children, but that gives me a good idea that that might work with adults. How would I scale that down and apply it for children? So I guess to try and, and pull that together, it comes back to this idea about definitions being really important and what are we talking about? Um, but also that, that when we talk about evidence-based practice, it's, it's not just a blind adherence to anything. It's a careful consideration of what the research and the learner's experience and our own judgment in this context uh, suggests to us that we need to reason our way forward, accepting always that our reasoning might be fallible. What's the best guess that we can do in this incredibly complex and unpredictable world? And, and I think, so there's a criticism often made, and you make a really valid point about this idea of, because so many threads I want to pull on there, by the way, but you make a really valid point about this idea, you know, we, we're amplifying the differences. And, uh, you know, Chris Kilmurray referred to this as a sort of nonsensical dualism between ecological dynamics and, and cognitive psychology. I don't think it is that, by the way. Um, you know, cognitive psychology is a field, as is ecological psychology. They're not necessarily, there are the theories that, under, that, that are then off shot from the fields, um, you know, such as information, information processing uh, versus, you know, a more kind of ecological approach, let's say. Anyway, um, the the idea that we're looking at the separation right so i think people say that this dualism is being created when say someone like rob gray points out the differences between an ecological approach versus the alternative an information processing approach he points out those differences and he's a, the accusation made is you're pointing out the differences you're creating the false dualism you're, you know, you're creating a difference between the two, and it's actually and suggesting that these, you, know, you can't you can't sort of mix your theoretical perspectives. Now, and I think what you what what he's doing is he's saying, and you, your point's a really good one, which is like if we're talking about evidence based practice, but actually if we recognise that the vast majority of coaches, and I'm including myself here, are actually operating from a bundle of beliefs, some of which derive from evidence, some of which might not 
and it's worth exploring those isn't it what are your beliefs yes. about coaching yeah. like you say and then but if we're working from a set of beliefs i'm assuming those beliefs can still guide us in what we're doing can still take into account the learner's perspective we can still use professional judgment but we're using a professional judgment based on what we believe to be true based on you know either based on evidence or based on our experiences now the thing is when we talk about these the differences i think what what i think some people in the ecological community are doing is they're because of the dominance of the narrative associated with the information processing approach they articulate the alternative perspective and then the assumption is is that like if you believe in this you can't do that and that's what and people go right well, i i won't be told that <laughs> and i get it right i totally and utterly understand that perspective but pointing out the theoretical incro 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 incongruity right is is not saying you can't it's just saying understand that there is a uh, a, a sort of an intellect or sorry a, a a, a disconnect between your belief about this and and what it is you're doing here and i think i think people find that very difficult to 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 come to terms with because they feel as if they're being told they can't do something and they're not they're just saying understand why you're doing that and like if you can genuinely you know as chris Kilmurray can you know I genuinely use cognitive load theory in this context with my learner for these reasons, yeah. go for your life, right? You've got the rationale, you understand it strongly enough, you can justify your method, and it's not just a blind belief, it's an evidence-informed practice, right? But he's, and what he's recognizing there, I think, is look, none of, this, none of these theories have enough explan explanatory power I think of these theories actually often as a bit like um, stories and narratives that have an explanatory power. None of these have enough explanatory power for me yet. So the pragmatic and, and actually you could argue ethically correct scenario is, is to take from all of them because they're, they've all, they're all right in some way and probably wrong in some way. I understand that. I get it. I understand that. But it's equally valid to make a choice to say, actually, because I'm now aware of the incongruity between these things, I'm going to operate uh, utilizing the evidence I have and the belief system that that's based on. I'm going to operate in this space because it feels uncomfortable to, 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 to cross over, if you like. Uh, sorry, there you go. No. No. So again, lots of, lots of threads to, to, to get into. I, I, will, I do want to say one thing at the start, actually, because we, we've been talking a little bit here about the kind of ecological family of theories versus the representation or cognitive family of theories, yeah. um, completely ignoring that if you were to come from an education background, you have a completely other family of theories, which is where game-based approaches and anybody using TGFU and game sense, that comes from an, a whole other family of theories outside of those two that we've been talking about so i think they're often forgotten about even though they're actually really central to coaching practice and, and what happens how would you um, how would you refer to those theories i actually really like um richard light's complex learning theory i think he tries to pull together a whole host of different constructivist theories to to explain those they 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 really emphasize the situated the importance of context that you get from ecological theories they also, because they emphasize the role of memory representations, have a cognitive element that comes with them as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they, they, they do actually borrow elements from, from both of those theories. But again, as you say, I, I think what ecological psychology offers, which is above and beyond others, is this concept of affordances and understanding perception action coupling and the specificity of information that is guiding action. I think... That's, that's a real strong contribution that you get from the ecological field, which has been their kind of specialist area. Mm. Um, sorry, so anyway, there's one, so we've got, you know, we've got more than two players in this, I guess, yeah, is one sure. bit that, yeah. that's important to, to, to make. Um, a second one is that we need to be very careful in terms of, because, you, you know, you do see these misconceptions 
around the different theories. And, and one that gets me a lot is this idea of, of uh, an idealized technique, a single idealized technique. That's not anything to do with contemporary representation-based theories. It's just not. The, the, and actually, when I say contemporary information-based theories, um, you know, this is Bartlett in the 1930s talking about each movement is not completely unique, but it is subtly unique from what has happened before. It's literally constructed in the moment. Um, you've got Martin Uke in the 1970s talking about how, you know, <laughs> yes, once you've got the basic idea of a movement pattern, you're kind of wasting your time just doing that isolated from the context because it's not the movement that you need to be concerned with. It's when to move and how to move, how to adapt that movement. So this for me is one where I think we've gotten and, and coaching practice. It's like coaching practice read the first part of the information processing model. Actually, the last part. And then they've devoted all their time to how do we do the last part of the model? forgetting that there's two other sections that have to happen as well. And so it's actually much more complex than maybe what we're seeing in, in practice. So um, number one, I think we need to be very, very clear and very, very careful as to well, actually what is it that you cannot do in one theory? And I think that is where you see an awful lot of misconceptions. You can't give instructions. You can't give direct instructions. Think, well, hang on a second. It's just, I would see it, and again, you might push back and others might, might push back on this, but um, I would see it very definitely as a, as a difference in how you're providing those instructions. So I would have no problem thinking I'm adhering to an ecological approach and saying, in this situation, this is what I'm seeing, and this is how I'm responding to what I'm seeing and how I think I'm just gonna solve the problem. Now, I'm not telling you this because I want you to copy what I'm doing, I'm telling you this because I want you to copy the broader process to understand what's happening around and to, to act in response and to adapt in response to that in a way that matches your capabilities. But the idea of, you know, I can provide you with an exemplar not to copy, but to encourage you to explore, that's very strongly matched with, with ecological approach. But I'm still giving you an exemplar. I'm still talking through. I'm not going to spend very long on it because it's not about repeating and replicating, but it's about guiding your attention. So for me, I think we need to be very clear as to actually, what is it that I'm not allowed to do in each of these different theories? And I think once we start thinking about that and unpacking that, actually you realize that we can make a lot of things fit. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And, and I don't, I think, I think this, and look, you can tell me if I'm wrong. If you've seen this, by all means, tell me. I don't know if anyone's ever said you can't do this. I think they've said, do you realize that if you're doing that, it's not in alignment with this theoretical standpoint or it's less in alignment with this theoretical standpoint or it's more in alignment with that theoretical standpoint? Let, and I'll give you an example. And you use the, you, so you use the example of... Um, uh, used instruction, but also use the idea of um, uh, it'll come back to me in a minute. But so, if you let's take instruction as an example, you're not allowed to use instruction. There's a mischaracterization happening, isn't there? And yes. I think it's fair to say that the mischaracterization happens both ways. I've definitely been guilty, I think, of mischaracterizing some uh, of the what you might call cognitively. Uh, influenced approaches that are, are you know and often mischaracterize them sometimes pejoratively calling them words like traditional and but but let's say that you know what 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 they often do these um theoretical standpoints is they postulate a an approach which i then think people build off so you, you let's use the growth mindset it's a really good example Gro growth mindset started out as this and then got bastardized by people building building things on it that it didn't ever deserve to have built on it. And then people say, well, that whole house of cards needs to be ripped apart because the stuff we built on it that shouldn't have been on it doesn't work. Yes. <laughs> so and I think this happens, it happens in, 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 every, in every sense. So, but 
fundamentally, there is an idea, right? And the idea is that this is this is the way humans learn best, or this is the way humans learn. This is our way that humans learn, maybe. <laughs> Sense making in the moment. Oh yeah, God, yeah, good. yeah. So, so this is our way that humans learn, and I think let, let's understand that that has got a predominance hasn't it that like sort of embedded itself in i was listening to um keith david's talking on a unrelated well it's not a sport it's not a non-sport related podcast an education related podcast learning design podcast quite interesting and he was talking about like the roots of many of these practices in coaching and he doesn't think they are necessarily theoretically based or they weren't at the time he talks about the influence of Taylorism, the influence of military training and how that then embedded itself into educational practice. And because a lot of educators became coaches that then transferred across into the coaching space and these traditions then, and then I think there was then theoretical stuff that came along that essentially supported the practice. I don't know if it was theoretically based in the first place. It could have been, you might know more than me, but the, it's interesting to listen to the history of coaching practice going back to the twenties and thirties and all the way through. So there's these ideas and they, they are fairly now in, entrenched and, you know, what you might call culturally resilient set of beliefs and the ecological approach directly smashes into them it directly says on a lot of different things it directly says it doesn't have to be this way go on um that sparked yeah, no, a thought I, the, the, well, the, a whole host of thoughts <laughs> um i think i think that that's a really nice one actually that 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 the coaching practice started first mm. i think the military connection is a nice one because if you look at the military training drills going right back to the, the 1800s and, and before um, you'll see an awful lot of this emphasis on drill and repetition, and, and you know that's predating a lot of the, the more the, the roots too. of the Olympic Games being military training. Yeah. Now, and and there's a there's a fabulous example from the Crimean War. Actually, one of my favourite kind of motor skill examples, and the, and the shortcomings of drill. Um, I can't remember if it was the charge of the light brigade or the heavy brigade, but one or other of them, and a surgeon was patching up a cavalryman who has head cut open. And he was trying to keep him talking. So he asked him, you know, what happened? And in the manuals at the time, they talked about, they had numbers for the different swings that you would have. So a thrust might be a one, a parry, a two, a cut would be a three, whatever the case was. Um, and the, the cavalryman says, well, I caught a five and the bloody idiot didn't parry at all. He just hit me over the head. <laughs> And I love that as an example of, you know, you, you get caught up with the movement and the dance that you're looking to do. It's not a dance. Um, so, but that certainly predates, you know, where, where a lot of the coaching practice came from. And I think it's a really important point or a nice point, because if you are to form an army in the 1700s, 1800s, from a group of people on continental Europe that speak lots of different languages, because again, we've got so many different local dialects. So, right, you've got hundreds of people that you need to get to move in synchrony and they don't all speak the same language, what kind of touching technique, what kind of technique will work in that context? Sure as hell not the technique that I want to see you using with a group of 10 year olds in athletics track or a soccer field or anything like that. Um, or likewise, that some of the basic ideas So Bernstein in his book, he describes you know, this, this idea about repetitive practice, repeating something over and over again. You know, that comes from some of the conditioning experiments that Pavlov was running in his lab. Now, if you think, so field hockey is your uh, sport, so if you think your average field hockey player learns in the same way as a sedated dog who's been chained to a post in a laboratory, then fair enough, we might be using some of these highly repetitive techniques. But cognitive load theory would not advocate that any more than ecological dynamics would advocate that. There's definitely some, some, some poor practices that have come about from possibly historical accidents, um, which have, have just remained. And I think after the fact, people are trying to say, well, that's consistent with this theory or this bit of this theory. Whereas, and I think we're both in agreement that if what we want is people really interrogating, does this actually work? And is this actually not just this method, but how much of this method I'm going to use? Is that bringing about the effects that I want or 
what are the other possible consequences to, to what I'm doing here? What else would I expect to see if this is really working or if this is not working? And I think that that for me, well, it almost comes back to, to one of the most important points in, in skill acquisition historically, which is that how well somebody performs in the moment is a pretty unreliable indicator of how well they are learning. Somebody can be performing really, really well right now, and it doesn't transfer over to the game. Or you come back to the next training session, it's like, well, where did all that performance go? <laughs> well, because performance and learning are not the same thing. But if we are judging the efficacy of our coaching on the basis of the immediate effects that it's having, then we're judging on a really reliable, unreliable indicator. And so as coaches, we need to understand that if I want to understand if this is working or not, I need to have a better test. And that mm. test needs to be something more than, than immediate performance. You mean when you say immediate performance, do you mean immediate performance within the training environment or do you mean immediate performance in the competition field? In the training environment. Right, yeah. So as in, you know, we, we, we run, you know, if, the, the classic, if, if I want somebody to, to shoot, you know, better free throws, you know, if they take 20 free throws in a row, 18, 19, 20 are probably going to be better than one, two, three. Mm. But it doesn't matter how good 18, 19, 20 are because you've only got up to two shots when you get on the, the court. So it's the two shots that count. Um, so, so, you know, the, the idea, so the, what I think with a lot of these theories is that they, they postulate an idea. So just to circle back to poor old Carol Dweck, let's tell you, I met her once. Um, I organized a conference with Kendall McQuaid. It was golf and rugby came together. Um, and uh, I met her. She's like, she can't be any taller than five feet tall. Um, and I, I remember thinking, you know, at that time, I was quite elderly, I'd say as well. And I remember thinking, blimey, you know, there's some absolute giants in that room. Like how she, and she just took to the stage and she's like an absolute rock star. Like, you know, when someone just absolutely encapsulates a room. Anyway, that's a bit of a by, there's a bit of a by the by. But anyway, so there's this sort of like idea um, in growth mindset that I think is extremely powerful. And the idea is that the way we communicate with anyone but with let's say with young people the way we communicate with young people can have a, quite a significant can have an effect on the way they then view challenge difficulty the way we approach difficulty um and, and i think that's a very powerful idea right now you know forget the kind of ins and outs of the efficacy of that that's an idea that's worthy of exploration i'm not going to take it as read necessarily but i'm going to say it's an interesting idea that's going to influence my approach to communicating with my children, with people I'm coaching, people I'm operating with. And it's definitely influenced my the way I parent, 100%. <laughs> my kids will probably tell you that when they have difficulty and I'm not necessarily paving the way for them and moving it out of the way and they really want me to, you know. So anyway, that, Carol, that's your fault. I blame her. Anyway, um. Uh, they, but anyway, so, so this, what I'm saying is, is this sort of underlying idea that then we take forward. Now, sometimes the way people take those ideas forward it doesn't. I've I've probably applied my, you know, the ideas of growth mindset incorrectly on occasions, and as a result of that, you know, it's probably like badly done, like you say before. Now, now I think that's true, though. Of so. With the cognitive, with the sort of the cognitive stuff, right? There's a, there's a fundamental idea, I think, in there, um, that the way a human being best learns to become proficient at, at at movement, sport in this case, a particular sport, is done in a sequential way, with less less information or you know reduced information and then increasing the information or the level of complexity if you like to a point where it can then be moved into front that now was that a, is that a fair articulation of that that, that, that is mm -hmm. but that's also a very fair articulation of ian renshaw's concept that the way a human being learns well new coordination patterns we might start with you know 1v0 type games 
and we might gradually increase that into to more diverse and more demanding games. So that the basic concept of you know simple to complex, mm-hmm. I think you see shadows and echoes of that in in different approaches. But equally, if we look at um, Joan Vickers, now Joan Vickers is most famous for Quiet Eye, but she also has an, an information processing theory based approach to coaching called decision training. And one of the characteristics of decision training is hard first training, which means you go complex to simple to complex. If you look back at the, the legacy of information processing accounts, they were talking about whole part whole prior to action systems theory as a precursor to dynamical systems, as a precursor to ecological dynamics. So I think um, I, I wouldn't say it's exclusive. The issues to that are exclusive to, to um, or oh, sorry, let me, let me pause and try and catch myself here. Um, what you were saying there in terms of there's, there's an emphasis towards that. Yes, there is an emphasis towards that within some representative approaches, but there's not as much of an emphasis as we see shining through in, in coaching practice. And I think that it's, it's possibly an overplayed. And the emphasis on that simplistic practice, again, you go back to Gentile in 1972. She writes about, you know, you, you simplify things until you have the idea of the movement. Not until you have the movement perfect, until you have the idea of the movement. The idea of, oh, this is what I'm trying to do. This is what it feels like. That's okay. I now know enough to try and go and apply that. Mm. That's the point at which you move on. Mm. not the point at which you can't do it incorrectly. So again, I think, I think there's, there's an awful lot more in the, the background of some of these ideas. I agree. And that's, I think that's where I was trying to get to, which was to say um, that the way that idea has now become manifest in practice is probably not necessarily what the research says or ne- necessarily what was intended. But that's what's become the practice. The traditional practice is based on a linearity yes. of, of learning journey. And obviously, where the ecological approach comes from is a inherent non-linearity. But the difference there is, it's not to say it only works in the opposite direction, as Ian Renshaw would say. What it's saying is it can work in both directions. This is certainly how I articulate it when I'm uh, when I'm introducing ecological concepts to new new group of coaches. I say, you know, one advocates a linearity. Now, it's not to say it's exclusively linear, but it certainly has manifest itself in there is a linearity to the approach, and that's what I think a lot of coaches resonate with. That resonates with my own experiences. That's what I've seen happen. That's generally the the approach that is is pres- prescribed or is adopted by most. So in order to challenge that belief, whether it's evidence-based or not, challenge that belief, I present the alternative, which is to say that movement can develop through context- adaptations to contextual change. And that's an alternative explanation with its own explanatory power. And so, and and that by changing that belief, then I if people do then go, well, that makes way more sense. <laughs> some do, some don't. Not everyone does. A lot of people are very skeptical, actually. Engineers, but, especially. Indeed, yeah. And I do think there's a link there between the way you're kind of like the way you're your belief well, about yeah. how the world works yeah yeah, yeah. If you, we can engineer this we can break this down to pieces and build it back together in, in that particular way yeah absolutely mm-hmm. yeah you know and I, I do notice that actually with so for example I've, i have lots of debates with a friend of mine who's it systems guy he's like don't come to me with your games based bullshit it's rubbish Right, it's much more sequential than that. It's about putting modules in place and da, 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 build it up, and there you've got yourself a machine. Obviously, the the computational model of human development maps onto his worldview massively. Now, ask him <laughs> next time. I, I, I want to just replay through how you built that last bit of code. I want to see: did you genuinely go one step, two step, two, or did you do a little bit? How is that working? Yeah. Ooh, fudge this, fudge this. So again, I, I think. Yeah, this is the really interesting one when you, whatever somebody says they do, mm. let's flip the bonnet or let's observe and see what actually happens 
And then we start to get into some really interesting observations that lead to some really interesting conversations, which lead us to test, coming back to almost where we started, okay, what do you believe? And is your, are your actions consistent with that belief or different from that belief because of, of what we're seeing here? The irony with this particular individual, by the way, is one of the most natural sportsmen you'll ever meet. And most of his development was backyard stuff, you know, just, you know, almost like the, the, the exact example of almost a Bradman thing as a cricketer or as a hockey player, amazingly good eye driven by the idea of playing, you know, lots of small sided or one to one with siblings, you know, that kind of thing. So but anyway, no amount of me explaining it this way will ever ever while away the two hour away games in the car, you know, <laughs> we have some interesting yeah, yeah. debates anyway. I digress. But so I guess I was coming on to this point of like the theories smashing into each other. I, on some levels, and I have been, you know, I famously said the war on drills and, you know, drills are the drugs of coaching and stuff. You know, that's a deliberate thing, right? It's a deliberate way of creating reappraisal. You know, in an, in an informationally o- overloaded world, it's a way of sort of suggesting to people, hey, look, here's something, here's a belief that you probably hold dear, the idea of a drill, which is so ingrained within the culture of coaching, the construct itself. What if you didn't have them? What if you got rid of them? Yes. What would happen? And that's oh, really to, tra- to, tra- to create reappraisal. And then ex- an exploration and, and some of that. Now, it's also caused me a lot of pain and anguish and and <laughs> people coming after me. But generally speaking, that's kind of a deliberate act. Now, I know it's potentially divisive and it potentially creates this separation. But I'm I'm hoping people understand enough to say that, like, just because there is a a degree of, you know, these two theories are kind of do have a degree of sort of. Like I feel like they're trying to bring magnets together and they just push against each other because there's so much sort of un- that's embedded within them that that makes it difficult to intertwine them. And and to challenge individuals to say, look, you know, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be going like, I'm just going to take a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other because of whatever it is the map's on. There are ways of actually exploring within a particular paradigm without being constrained as much as people probably think they are yeah well very good and and and, i mean at the end of the day in sport we are looking to develop adaptive performers Mm. people who are able to adapt to the situations that they find themselves in we we have a common goal and we recognize that you know we know what that skillful performance looks like it is movement that is adapted to meet the needs of the, the situation um so the question then becoming well how do we how do we get towards that and how do we get towards that in as, as efficient a way as possible with as many you know, extra benefits as we possibly can? So if we can do it in a more enjoyable way, where well, we get the learning and we get the enjoyment, that's fantastic. We get an enjoyable way in which they develop really good connection to their, their peers and they enjoy the session. Well, again, there's two ancillary benefits. So I do think it's always worthwhile. Uh, and I love that idea of, okay, well, what if I said you... you you couldn't use a drill. That drill you've got in your session. All right, I want you to take that out mm. and I need you to replace it with a different type of activity. Mm. Now, this is where you've got to be creative. What activity can you come up with that will provide an appropriate level of challenge to the individual, but is also within their capacity? Because we often think about, well, no, we have to do drills because they we got to simplify it down. Well, what other ways can we can we simplify things down? Um, And I do, again, this is where, as opposed to being limiting, I think a lot of coaches, and Philip O'Callaghan is one who shares a lot of things in in relation to tennis, actually find it liberating Mm. that the theory is not restricting their options, it's opening up new vistas to them in terms of how they can do this. Um, Now, I would equally argue that if somebody stumbled across cognitive load theory, that would inspire them as to new things that they could try, as well as ecological dynamics will will, will offer that. And I do think, again, you've come back several times to the idea of, you know, without a theory, you are rudderless. Mm. And I, and I, I do think that's important. Mm. You know, you do have to have, and maybe it's very hard to say for me to say theory, because again, I'm trying to keep the scientific conception of what a theory is, but I do think you absolutely have to have very clear reasons for why you're doing what you're doing. And I think 
an understanding of how the world works, which is what a theory is, how learning happens, what accelerates learning. I think that will absolutely help you to stay consistent and aligned in terms of what you're, what you're doing. Um, but I think if we have people who are questioning, why am I doing what am I doing? What, what else, how else could I do this? And critically, they have somebody there who is holding them to account almost or asking them questions or, or encouraging them to, to evidence that hypothesis, not allowing them to fool themselves. Maybe not immediately, but over time, I trust that that individual will develop towards more and more and more effective practices because they, they're, they're testing what they're doing, they're considering, they're exploring other options, and they've got something to hold them to, to account. Um, but it's a human learning is just an enormously complex topic embedded in lots of other really complex topics. Yeah, that's and again, that's that's the that's the one of the challenges. That, I mean, as you were talking, then I'm it, you're making me think about um, this idea. I think of you know in um, your master's students, and you know if you are doing people doing PhDs. If you do a master's and you do your sort of final, you know, your kind of your project or your dissertation, is it similar to a PhD where you have a, a, a viva or a viva and then you have to sort of defend your research? Does it work like that in your master's or is it just a PhD where you do that? Uh, mostly in PhDs, that's standard. And actually in our master's, we do have a 20 minute. You don't present anything. It's just a and a We'll have read your paper or we'll have read your, your project and we'll have lots of questions for you. And, and we do something like that. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I, I really like that about like the academic community. I mean, in the relatively short time that, you know, I was doing, I was in the academic community doing PhD stuff. One of the things I really liked was there'd be, you know, there'd be symposia or seminars organized fairly regularly where individuals would come and sort of, you know, and sort of, you know, kind of put forward their research. You see it done in like poster sessions now and stuff, but they put forward their research and they almost have it then interrogated by the room in a kind of live peer review type of thing yes. yeah um and i think there's something really uh valuable about that and, and i don't see that in coaching as much in fact i don't see peer review in coaching at all i remember distinctly i was um i was i got hired uh to work within the england hockey talent pathway a number of years ago now and um and one you know so the you know i was part of a community of um probably about 30 odd coaches all you know, kind of striving, working with, you know, kind of the next generation, if you like, 16 to 18 year olds, right? It's a really great community to be part of and great to sort of, you know, rub shoulders and stuff. And then one of the things they set up was we all had to kind of do a 10, 15 minute, four or five slide type of presentation on a, an aspect of, of the game that we're passionate about and we, you know, an, an approach that we were interested in and things. I was really excited by it. Like I'd never had that chance to do that with my peer group before to present it and then to defend it, you know, or to, you know, talk openly about why this is important, or why I believe in it and all those sorts of things. And they pulled it at the last minute because a number of the individuals amongst the group felt really uncomfortable doing that in front of others. I was so disappointed because I just, I would love coaching to normalize that practice of, here's my ideas. This is what some of my ideas are based upon. This is why I do some of the things the way I do them. What do you reckon? And to have that open dialogue about that approach. And it, it, I just, you might do it in yours. And that's probably one of the reasons I probably need to sign up. But generally speaking, like, you know, that's just such a powerful mo mode of learning for coaches. I think there's a really important point here around how do, how, how are coaches supported to do that and to engage in that. Mm. Um, and if, this, is, this is slightly peripheral, but I'll, I'll try and steer it back in again. Um, think about all the decisions that a coach has to make over the course of a, of a season. And um, if we take, you, you mentioned kind of talent development, so maybe it doesn't quite fit, but let's say you've got a, an under 13 team and you've got 12 year olds and 11 year olds on the team. Okay. Do they all get equal playing time? That's a decision that has to be made. And that decision is made based on a, a belief about what you know, a good sport experience looks like. Mm -hmm. um, what about the 12-year-olds? You know, do they 
do they start because it's their last year in the age group and the 11 year old will automatically start next year or is it does it go the other way around uh it does depend on on training time you know how much time you're actually coming to training what about positions you're going to rotate positions or stick to specific positions or what's the, the kind of decisions the rules around there there are lots of questions that a coach will have to answer in terms of okay how are we going to run this over the course of a season and if you're at a club where you've got maybe multiple coaches with that team that's a discussion within the, the team if you're at a bigger club where you've got multiple teams does the club want all the coaches to be implementing the same kind of policy so there's maybe a starting point i saw a lovely example um, from a, a gaelic football club down in kerry where they have a coach's code of conduct now for me it's probably a terrible name to have for the document but the basic idea is what are all the decisions that we're going to have to make over the course of the season and we're going to make them as a club and we're going to agree them at the AGM at the start of the year. And then we're going to follow that document. So actually, as coaches, we don't have any decisions to make about those broader questions because they've all been made for us already. Now, if you as a coach disagree with that decision, you think, no, do you know what? This equal playing time, I'm happy with it at 11 years of age, but I also want to have it at under 13 or vice versa. Well, you get to bring that notion to the AGM and say, well, I want to debate this. And if we if I get agreement, we change it. If I don't, we don't. So the idea then becomes, well, this is this is the place for us to debate. And this is the place for us to agree how we're going to, to do this going forward. And it becomes for me a kind of a I mean, the ideal situation would be that regardless of what situation you come up against as a coach over the course of the season and you find yourself wondering, what am I going to do here? What's the pros or cons? You've got your coach's code of conduct to refer back to. The analogy I'll often use with this is it's a bit like a pilot's handbook. You know, pilot gets into trouble. What do they do? Pull out the handbook, go to the relevant section. Some pilot somewhere will have met that problem and it's now in the book. And I think one of the issues we have in coaching is a lack of institutional knowledge. So coaches move on or we lose actually how do we deal with these situations? I think something like a coach's code of conduct can be really helpful as a way of guiding coaches' practice. But the process by which we develop that coach's code of conduct, that we decide what are we about as a club, what is our beliefs, and how are we going to put those beliefs into action? I think of Salisbury Rovers that the two of us know of and I think greatly admire not just for what they do, but how they articulate what they do. I think for me, that's a really great starting point to, to show coaches the benefit of having those discussions. And if they start with those kind of decisions, over the coming years, could they progress into the, the more finer discussions around the nuances of coaching practice? Yeah, I, I, I think that's... Um... It's a really useful articulation, actually. And interestingly, those examples you gave, like equal game time or do the older ones get more than the younger ones because it's their last year and all those sorts of things. They're the kinds of questions that get posed to coaches all the time and they don't have a readily available guide that they can refer to. And this is a discussion that I had. A, one of the reasons I left a club as a coach was because they didn't want to do that work. They didn't want to articulate what they were about, what the ideals or the beliefs the club had about the experience. They, your point about, I love this, the lack of institutional knowledge. In coaching, very often the knowledge is proprietorial, isn't it? Yes. It is held by the coach. And they said that. No, it, it is each coach's responsibility to decide how they run their team, which then meant that like, you had one coach saying, I'm doing it this way. And then you had another coach saying, I'm doing it this way. And then when the, the young people move from one to the other, they just left. <laughs> of course they did. It's an incredible shock to the system. And the, the Christopher Henriksen has a fantastic case study with um, a Swedish athletics club. I, I'm not going to even try to pronounce them. Um, but they had exactly that problem. So we had a coach who wanted to do things, which was in opposition to how we do things as a coach. They, the particular coach wanted basically a high performance group starting earlier, very commonly kind of brought in. And the club said, we'd really love you to coach, 
But if you're not going to coach in a consistent way with our principles, then you're not going to coach at our club. Because this is what we believe is best for the young athletes within our care. And this is what we're going to hold true to. Now, it's not to say that those beliefs can never you know, shift or change or that they won't evolve. Of course they'll evolve. But like the pilot's handbook, okay, because again, equal playing time. I'm not pretending that that's a simple answer. There might be lots of nuance and context and different bits that we have to consider within that. That's fine. Over the course of five years, over the course of all the experiences that coaches have had in the past, can you write a more nuanced guide? Everybody gets equal playing time. Might be appropriate at some age groups. But at some point, if you've got a performance team and they're looking to really develop, you're going to shift those guidelines. Well, it's not. you don't want it to be a, a complete jump. On Number one, everybody gets equal playing time. And then the next year, suddenly it's a complete well, maybe you do. It's again something that the group can debate. But I would, I would suggest it probably needs to be a more gradual and nuanced shifting through. But again, write that nuance into the guides. These are the factors that you need to consider. But capture it as, as institutional knowledge for the club, which is then incredibly useful for novice coaches and new coaches who are, who are coming in and are time impoverished. And they might not get the time to go and shadow a more experienced coach. But if they need help and they know there's a guiding document that can help them, well, they can they can go after that. Well, it makes the coach less vulnerable as well, because then it's yes. not it's not the coach's decision. It, they're actually saying, oh, look, this is a consensus perspective. Going back to your point about consensus, consensus perspective that we've agreed Now you may not like it or you may have some different views. And you've got a couple of choices. You can make that case. And then the club could consider it and change it, or you could go somewhere else. But fundamentally, it's not the coach's decision. It's a, and I actually think it also helps when it comes to hiring and it comes to or recruiting, yes. because you can say to people, it dispels a lot of fear. I mean, the interesting thing for me, this is why I don't like, and it's coming back to something you said earlier on, right? So I was rereading uh, It Depends. Um, there was a, it's a paper in fact i'll get the title of it now um what was it called it it depends coaching the most um i have it here as well yeah, yeah. the most it's fundamental simple, simple or complex a, principle or a mere cop-out, mere cop-out. Yeah. yeah i don't think the paper necessarily answers that question so it's a really unfortunate title but anyway <laughs> there's a there's a point so the thing i don't like about it depends or professional judgment and decision making and you made this point about evidence based practice and the third the third strand was professional judgment yes. now i do have a bit of a problem with that because let's just take this example that you you've used which is really a really nice one which is let's say there isn't the institute there isn't the coach the pilot's handbook or the coach's handbook or the coach's code of conduct right and the coach is there for they've they've taken on the job right cuz you know no one else is there to do it or whatever reason and they're tr- doing their best and you know, have a lot of sympathy and a lot of empathy for people who are in that situation they they haven't necessarily got an underpinning theory or reference point or even necessarily appropriate education whatever it might be even those who've had who've been on a course we know that a lot of coach education courses are inadequate to enable coaches to genuinely work through and understand and deal with the challenges they're going to be faced but there they are having to make these daily week you know weekly daily hourly minute by minute decisions that affect you know young people and their caregivers sometimes adults you know whatever right so you're doing that situation and there's this idea that well it depends and this idea that well you just use your professional judgment and your decision making well there's a huge assumption there that there's to have professional judgment the very definition of it is such that you have a degree of underpinning knowledge institutional or proprietorial or otherwise so usually as we as i've explained earlier on it's usually experiential so we draw upon our experiences in order to help us make those decisions and this then becomes what you refer to as folk pedagogy you know gets passed on passed on passed on very culturally resilient difficult to change so i see it as a responsibility in presenting an alternative to what might be normalized something that is not necessarily mainstream yet albeit increasingly so 
uh, and present the alternative as a mechanism by which to equip coaches with a different conceptualization to help them with that decision making process. If we're going to commit to, if we're going to say PJ, you know, I'm, I'm not, by the way, I'm not against the notion of PJDM. I'm against the notion as that's all you need. Like it's, it really isn't. It really, it really makes a lot of very big assumptions about the level of knowledge that an individual has in this, like you said before, you know, you've got a hot mess inside a dumpster fire <laughs> You know, in terms of the kind of challenges that people are facing because of the complexity layered into the complexity into the complexity. And to say that anyone's, you know, the, oh, you just need professional judgment. Ooh, I'm sorry, you need much more than that. And like you say, even just a pilot's handbook or the coach's con code of conduct would be something that would be useful as a helping starting point to help with this professional judgment. But if you make it proprietorial, it's just the individual needs to make their professional judgment without any other reference points necessarily. Necessary. I know it doesn't necessarily say that, but that's the that's the inference people can make. I just feel like that's really it's a really difficult message for me to swallow. If that's if that's fair, I, rip that apart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think the professional part is really important there at the start. Mm. You know, because what what differentiates a profession, and it is a it's, it's a body of knowledge. And so again, in, in coaching, Jean yeah. Cote, we're talking about it's your your what to coach, how to coach knowledge, but also your interpersonal knowledge and your intrapersonal knowledge. So actually, there's an enormous amount of underpinning knowledge that's required to to make reasoned decisions in tough situations. And I think. So I, I don't know that a novice can engage in effective professional judgment decision-making because well, they haven't got that underpinning. No. They haven't got that to, to draw upon. Um, I think we're always looking to, to, to help people to reason out why they're doing what they're doing. Maybe after the fact as opposed to during it. I mean, there's a... There's a couple of famous examples in um, Gary Klein's book where he talks about, you know, a firefighter walks into a building and something's not right. He doesn't know yeah. what's right, but he pulls yeah. everybody out. You've yeah. got somebody on a, on a battleship and they, they, is it they shoot down the missile? Sorry, they shoot down the blip on the screen. They don't know if it's a missile or if it's a passenger airplane. Mm -hmm. And even after the fact, they fired the missile, they don't know what they've just done, mm -hmm. but they've made a decision. It turns out, they recognize something in the, the timing of that blip and how it moved across the screen that, that gave a particular signature, but it yeah. was below conscious, conscious awareness. So I'm, I'm not saying that effective decision-making has to be conscious. That's not the case. It's clearly not the case. There's an awful lot of intuitive decision-making that happens that's very effective. But I think that does need to be interrogated afterwards and an attempt made to understand you know, what's guiding that, what's the reasoning, what's the... the the knowledge that's informing that um, while acknowledging that it's incredibly difficult to get definite answers, that we're running huge risks of folk pedagogies. And so the question becomes, well, what, what mechanism do we build in to stop this becoming a folk pedagogy? And there's, I think, so many examples. When we talk about information processing in, in a Gaelic games context in Ireland at the moment, you look at games-based approaches, I think probably right now, because the term is, is, is a sexy term, lots of coaches would, would describe themselves as a game-based approach coach. Um, I had a student in the office the other day talking to me about his coach last season, and his approach was they did the warm-up, then they played a full-sided game, then they went home. <laughs> is that a games-based coach? Or you've got, well, I use mostly games, so I must be a game-based approach coach. But you look at the sessions and they go simple drills, small side of games, bigger condition games, full side of games. Now, definitions of game-based approaches, it's not just about how many games that you use, but it's also about the sequencing of activities. It's also about how you're interacting with individuals, getting them to interact with each other during the session. So there's a massive misunderstanding. There's a folk pedagogy now building up around what game-based approaches are. And unless we address that folk pedagogy, unless we correct and un develop people's understanding 
developed our knowledge about what game-based approaches genuinely are, we're going to lead, we're going to have a lot of coaches who are dissatisfied with game-based coaching, but they're not dissatisfied with game-based coaching because they haven't done game-based coaching. They're dissatisfied with a, a half, a bit of game-based coaching, which is cobbled together with something else. Mm. And I think this is a real risk that we have with, with, a, with a mix and match, with an uncritical mix and match, mm -hmm. I think you have a real risk of, of not getting the benefit of either approach. Exactly. Um, however, I, I, I want to be really clear that I'm not saying that, you know, people like Chris that you mentioned earlier are uncritical. No, 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 definitely not. Because I think they're, they're absolutely, it, it's, the, it's the reasoning and critical thinking around and the evidence for what I'm doing that we really want to encourage and to put structures in place to, to help coaches to develop an appreciation of. But it's a really hard thing to do. Yeah, hundred percent. I am, um, and I think for for me, um, that's that's the real worry. I mean, just going back to this point about professional coaching is not a profession, and I'm working at the moment to professionalize coaching, uh, certainly in England, um, and to profession. You know, I mean, there was an you'll you'll remember this. There was an articulation under the UK coaching framework what, 15 years ago, um, the start of my career or midway through, um, you know, and we were, were for coaching to become a professionally regulated vocation. They, that was the language used. And it never materialized. And in the process over the last four or five years of articulating and talking about the professionalization of coaching, I have experienced a lot of resistance by workforce development professionals and policymakers and system builders who have said, but we don't want it because the volunteers will walk away. But interestingly, at the next breath, they'll talk about, but we want to be recognized. We want to be recognized for our expertise and our knowledge and our skill. And we want to be um, you know, treated better. And we want to be more, well, we want to be more respected. And we want you know, pay rates and all these sorts of things. You can't have one without the other. But to be a profession, you need things like a code of conduct or a code of practice. You need a regulatory authority that will deal with transgressions. You need a route to, for an individual to be able to make a complaint about somebody's practice. Yes. And all of these sorts of things, right, that need to be built up in order, you know, you, you also need a representative body for the coaches in, in the case of a malicious complaint made against them that's unfounded and where do they get their response and defense. So there's a lot to do if you're going to professionalize but having that professionalism then means there is a degree of accountability and then means that that individual who has that badge of professional and therefore can say that they are a professional an individual who is a professional as a coach um, and is therefore prepared to be regulated by the professional conduct authority whoever that might be or whatever it might be against a set of professional standards and all those sorts of things which you need as well so it's a you know, bewildering difficult thing to do, nonetheless, still worthy, right? It's a worthy thing and on the process of doing so. And But that's done so that individuals would then be able to say that they have used their professional judgment because it is then a profession. But you can't ask that now because coaching is this bewildering array of individuals from all walks of life doing a, a variety of different things with different risk profiles. So we talk about, when you talk about regulation and yes, regulatory yeah, activity, yeah. we talk about right touch regulation. Because <clears throat> if you were to just put a blunt instrument of regulation in place, you would see a vast array of people who are just well-meaning helpers, you know, providing an absolute fundamental role within the sports ecosystem that is without which, you know, they're the backbone, without which you they'd walk away. Of course they would like why would you otherwise like why do you want to be held to that let that standard but there are others who need to be held to that standard why because of the nature of the job that they're doing the risk profile that they have and all of those sorts of things i've veered into my day job now but i do think that's an important factor to consider if we're just going to loosely talk about nebulous terms like professional judgment and decision making they do have to have a degree of underpinning institutional support to actually be materially real yeah yeah and, and i look it, it's it's a it's an incredibly 
complex question as well. Stephen Harvey spoke a while back about, I think in the US, coaches were becoming paid, but not necessarily more professional. Yep. And so you also have that kind of danger that comes in with this. Um, I think you're absolutely right in terms of you know the, 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 the extensive work that's required to, to bring coaching up to professional standard. I think we're always going to have a very large number of volunteer coaches, certainly in, in an Irish context. It's just, it's, it's interwoven with the nature of some of the sports, especially. Sure, 100%. Um, and there's a lot of positives to, to come from that. I guess the question comes back to, you know, how do we see a better quality of coaching? So even if coaching is not a profession, the, 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 quality of coaching that we see is that which we might expect from a profession so i think one of the one of the interesting things i think that comic rugby did here was that they took session design now i gotta be careful how i phrase this they gave coaches the option if you don't want to plan your session here you can have our session here's some ideas about how you might adapt them one of the big issues that they saw around coaching we've got coaches meeting in the first 10 minutes they're just standing around trying to plan a session or there's really poor transitions between sessions and we're actually we're getting a lot of wasted time in sessions what if we just gave them an option we're not saying you have to use this but we're saying if you want to here's a session you can run mm. and you know what it might not be the best session but you're not going to hurt anybody and it's not going to be the worst session that we get so we've got a minimum standard that we're putting in place yeah to kind of support coaches and I do think when you're dealing with, with just, just the volunteer coaches who, who, who are enthusiastic and want to enjoy the coaching journey, but don't necessarily want to be the best coach they can be. And I think, again, we sometimes are in danger of thinking about all coaches are like, you know, they want to be the best coach they could possibly be. Whereas actually that's not the case. They're quite happy coaching where they are and doing what they are and doing it doing it well and enjoyably and bringing about good benefits for the, for the individuals. Um, I think what is the, how can we attract them mm. to mm. some kind of, of, whether you call it theory or some kind of, of uh, guidelines that will allow them to be more effective without turning them off the conversation at the same time. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a danger with the conversation is too uh, aggressive then we end up actually missing the majority of people that we want to entice into the conversation and again to go back to as i say the majority of people that i've met who've, who've encountered ecological dynamics it's not limiting it's liberating it's giving them more opportunities and so that's what we really want actually any coach's engagement with coach education should be empowering them and inspiring them in terms of what more they can do how more efficient or effective they can be um as, as, a, as a real goal that definitely maps onto my experience it's one of the and it's one of the reasons i you know i'm so passionate about sharing this information with others about ecological approach is is because i found it exactly that liberating i was shackled and constrained by a particular toolbox that I felt was ineffective and actually laden with conflict and challenge. And then I found something else that just opened up a different conceptualization of my role and how, how I then interact with a group that has been transformative, not without its challenges, yes, not without its limitations, you know, but, but transformative. And I guess that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm kind of advocate, an advocate, you know, and, and yes, a, a, admittedly, an advocate to the exclusion of the old, you can, there's plenty of places you can go for that, right? <laughs> plenty. <laughs> we're in my shop, we're only selling these sweets. <laughs> and I guess, and again, it's something that, that I, I hear from, and I, I, I guess it's what I'm more, most interested in. And I'm most interested in hearing from you know, those who are working with and embracing and, and developing in an ecological dynamics framework, 
but equally interested in hearing from those who are you know t- taking again what i would call kind of a contemporary representation based mm-hmm. you know how are you making this work for you yeah 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 you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. I, i'm yeah. not interested in the limitations i'm interested in how are you making this work to develop more adaptive performers mm-hmm. to develop more engaged performers Mm. to develop more connected groups of individuals if we're talking about youth level so you know i think how are you making this work to achieve these i think we can certainly agree the outcomes that we want from 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 youth sport in particular are coming across so it's how are you using this method to achieve these or this approach rather to achieve these outcomes yeah that's interesting idea uh an hour and 54 minutes (laughs) <laughs> where did that go <laughs> uh, yeah that definitely shot this is a record one uh hey we better i better draw draw it to close not least not least for the, the reason that i do need to prepare tonight's session uh which is in two hours time um listen great thank you for taking the time to speak to me uh dealing with the internet issues that you had um and i yeah it's been a really and I, i'm sorry we've been we've really meandered and gone in a lot of different directions but i just thought it, I, I do love this idea of a bundle of beliefs and I, and it's you know i'm reflecting now on how many of mine you know and what what is the basis of them and how defendable are they but it's you know nonetheless really interesting i think again uh really really useful i said at the start i didn't have a, a uh, a specific viewpoint I was trying to get across. This was a sense-making exercise for me as much, and, and so uh, needs to, probably needs to be sold as such. But I think really useful. Really, uh, you've got me thinking about certain aspects that I want to try and bring out more in, in kind of engagement with coaches as well going forwards, and trying to, to again just unpack and understand where I want to go with this and what what this means for my working with coaches. Brilliant. Well, I, I know you're still a relatively active you know you're relatively active in the social space from time to time and very often got things to share and not least of which when uh, movement skill acquisition island comes back um so um is there a way people can get in touch that uh, you'd recommend easiest way is probably through through social media and um i was going to say twitter but x i suppose i should say but uh, <laughs> i'm going to stick with twitter um, me too at, at carney underscore phil is probably the easiest way to to connect with me uh and to see some of the aspects um and then at msa ireland is the the twitter handle for the the larger group that's looking at you know uh, how we can i guess create a a safe pace sp- safe space for discussing what skill acquisition is and, and and how it can be again ideally how it can be liberating how it can be inspiring for individuals to who want to explore their practice in that way Phil, appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. Um, and um, I'm not going to leave it as long before we we reconnect and have further ruminations. That's good. <laughs> Thanks very much, Stuart. Cheers.